Hello, everyone, and welcome to this third Returning to Dance webinar. My name is Erin Sanchez, and I am the Health, Wellbeing, and Performance Manager here at One Dance UK. Um, I'd just like to welcome you to this webinar and let you know that we are going to be focusing today on fixed groups and bubbles, indoor exercise, ventilation, and face covering. We'll be signposting to relevant UK government guidance for England, and we'll also be providing an opportunity to ask questions. Just a little bit of a brief explanation about the context of these webinars. Public health is a devolved issue, and any references to government guidance or roadmaps for returning to work in this presentation are specific to England at this time. Guidance for Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales is yet to be published. Government guidance will also evolve with science. No one has all the answers as medical and scientific understanding of coronavirus disease is developing. As such, through these webinars, we aim to provide a space to consult with experts, raise questions, and identify issues and share practice. We also aim to support practical implementation of government guidance across the dance sector to help everyone return to dance safely. We also encourage you to take the following steps to support your return to dance planning. Read the relevant government guidance, Use creativity as well as common sense to think about how you can address the requirements laid out in government guidance. Consider the resources available to you and think realistically about how you can address guidance within your available resources. Discuss ideas with others and test or pilot these ideas to see how well they work in practice. These webinars are hosted by our Dance Medicine and Science expert panel. This group of people advises all of our work in dancers' health, well-being, and performance. Our panel today will be chaired by Andrew Hurst, One Dance UK's CEO, and our panel members will be Kim Hutt, Professor Matthew Lyon, and Dr. Roger Woolman. Again, we have the pleasure of our wonderful BSL interpreter, Ali Gordon, helping us today. And just very briefly to uh, explain how to use this webinar, we'll try to address as many questions as possible live during the session. All questions will be answered in writing and will be available on One Dance UK's website for everyone to access following the session. Also, we've added a feature to this webinar where if you see someone else has asked the same question that you have, you can see it in the Q&A box and upvote it. By upvoting, it means that that question moves nearer the top of the list to be answered. We hope that this will help every question to be answered more efficiently. So without any further ado, I'd like to hand, hand you over to Andrew Hurst, our CEO. So, uh, hello everybody, a very warm welcome. Uh, it's really good to see some familiar names in the participant list, um, but there are also lots of you who are new to us. So One Dance UK is the sector support organization for dance, and it's also a membership organization. We advocate for the needs of dance to politicians and policy makers, funders, education, and other bodies on matters concerning children and young people, diversity, health and well-being for dancers and wider society, and for, for, for professionals, including freelancers. If you're not already a member, then please join. Together, we're stronger. The UK government published guidance and a roadmap for reopening the performing arts last week that allowed live outdoor performances from Saturday the 11th of July. We're currently in stage three of a five stage roadmap. We're also involved in some pilot events, testing indoor performances with a socially distanced audience over the coming weeks ahead of the move to stage four. Actually, 
uh, breaking news today. Stage, uh, the Prime Minister has just announced that stage four um, will be possible from the 1st of August, assuming uh, prevalence stays the same uh, for the virus. So that means uh, from the 1st of August, barring any uh, disasters in the next few weeks, uh, live performances indoors with a socially distanced audience uh, will be possible. But this roadmap applies to England, but Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales are currently developing their own guidance, uh, and that, which is likely to be very similar, if perhaps a little later, as we've seen already through the easing of the lockdown. Uh, it's worth noting that reopening requires a written risk assessment for anyone employing, employing more than five employees to show how you've addressed COVID-19. We covered this in the session on Wednesday this week, which you can find on our website and our YouTube channel. So today we're covering social distancing. Uh, social distancing remains at two meters, except where you make mitigations such as the following. Increasing hand washing and cleaning of common touch points like toilets or communal areas, keeping activity time as short as possible, using back-to-back -back or side-to-side -side working rather than face-to-face, -face. screens to divide people, and or the use of fixed groups or teams. The same principles that you apply to participants, audiences, or attendees, whether you're running or hiring venues, you should consider social distancing and matching capacity to that how common touch points are safely managed and communicate this work to participants and audiences before they attend to build their confidence. So before handing over to our panel to introduce themselves and give a brief overview of the sections they're talking about, I'd like to add that dance studios in England can fully open next week on the 25th of July, following the guidance on grassroots, sport, leisure and gymnasium. The first section is on fixed groups and bubbles, um, which Roger is going to take now. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for attending uh, this webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Roger Wallman. I am medical advisor to uh, one dance I've uh, been working with this organization for many years and uh, ran an NHS uh, dance medicine clinic from uh, 2012 to uh, 2019. Um, so uh, obviously the whole COVID crisis has changed the way we interact with each other, how we, how we are able to work and obviously has had a profound effect on the performing arts section uh, as well as society in general. So uh, this is a challenging uh, objective to get everyone back into dance and to get audiences in there. So the government have been very, very helpful in trying to put this guidance together. And uh, I strongly recommend that you uh, read the government guidance on this and where we're up to at the moment. We'll just go through this in the next uh, few slides, some of the key points. So professionals working in the performing arts are permitted to return to their activities in line with the performing arts guidance as uh, mentioned at the bottom of the page. Uh, Non-professionals, uh, those participating in performing arts other than for work purposes or groups which include non-professionals may also refer to this guidance for their activities but must at all time do in, so in line with government legislation and guidance on meeting people outside the household. People should continue to socially distance from those they do not live with wherever possible. Social interaction should be limited to a group of no more than two households indoors and out or up to six people from different households if outdoors. And we'll come down to the relevance of indoors versus outdoors uh, later on in the webinar. Uh, it's against the law for gatherings of more than 30 people to take place in private homes and that also includes gardens and other outdoor spaces. 
Business and venues following uh, COVID-19 secure guidelines can ho host large groups. This is also the case for events in public outdoor spaces that are organised by businesses, charitable and political organisations and public bodies, providing that they take reasonable steps to mitigate the risk of transmission in line with the COVID-19 secure guidance and including uh, completion of a risk assessment. Any other gatherings in outdoor space must not be any larger than 30, as we've already indicated. So the performing arts guidance requires maintaining that two metre social distance rule wherever possible, or one metre with very robust mitigation where two metres is not possible. You should, you should consider and set up the mitigations you will introduce into your risk assessment. Mitigation does not include the basic measures which should be a given. That's good hand and respiratory hygiene and compliance should be universal. Where the social distancing guidelines cannot be followed in full in relation to a particular activity, organisations should consider whether that activity needs to continue for it to operate and if so take all mitigating actions possible to reduce the risk of transmission between their staff, participants and their visitors. Further mitigations include the following, increasing the frequency of hand washing and surface cleaning including disinfection of high footfall areas or common touch points with particular attention to toilets and restrooms. Keeping the activity time of any activity where social distancing cannot be maintained to as short as possible and where possible using screens or barriers to separate people from each other. Another really key point is uh, making use of back-to-back -back or side-to-side -side working rather than face-to-face -face, as this is likely to reduce transmission uh, from uh, respiratory effect and then reducing the number of people each person has contact with by using fixed teams or partnering so each person works only with a small number of others. No further restric restrictions on singing and brass wind instruments. Where the social distancing guidelines cannot be followed in full in relation to a particular activity organizers <clears throat> organizations should consider whether that activity needs to continue and if so take all mitigating actions possible to reduce the risk of transmission between staff workers participants and audiences mitigation action mitigating actions can include the following uh, further increasing frequency of hand washing and surface cleaning keeping the activity time involved as to as short as possible and as I've said, using back-to-back -back and side-to-side -side positioning rather than face-to-face -face wherever possible. So we'll now hand over to Kim Hutt. Hello everyone and thanks for joining. Um, my name is Kim Hutt and I am the Head of Physical Support at London Contemporary Dance School. Uh, my role there involves looking after the physical well-being of all of the students on their degree programme. So continuing on from where Roger has just left us, thank you Roger, um, social distancing in performing arts environments. So mitigating actions include reducing the number of people each person has contact with by considering the use of fixed teams, group, groups or partnering so each person works with only a few others. For example, where social distancing may be impractical due to the degree of proximity required, such as intimate fighting scenes in theatre, um, dancing, costume fitting, hair and makeup. Grouping individuals into fixed teams that work together throughout a production project or project or for specific periods to minimize the risk of transmission beyond these six teams. 
minimizing transmission risk between fixed teams when they mix outside their team during a rehearsal or performance and during breaks or moving around a premises or venue. Ensuring that there is no swapping between designated fixed teams. This is to reduce the risk of whole team impact in the event of a worker contracting COVID-19. Including any support workers for disabled workers or performers as a member of the fixed team. Please note that it's unlikely that this fixed team approach will be possible in non-professional environments or where professional performers work with more than one group or organisation simultaneously. Fixed teams could be operated as follows, using screens where feasible to separate individuals or fixed teams from each other where they cannot achieve social distancing. It is not recommended for non-professionals to consider activities that require social distancing to be compromised. Social distancing applies to all parts of a premises or venue, not just the place where people spend most of their time, but also entrances and exits, break rooms, dressing rooms, canteens, foyers and bars, and similar settings. These are often the most challenging areas to maintain social distancing. Assessing the capacity of any space to be used and appropriately managing this to maintain social distancing. Guidance on meeting people outside of your household says you should only meet people you do not live with in three types of groups. You can continue to meet in any outdoor space in a group of up to six people from different households. Single adult households, in other words, adults who live alone or with dependent children only, can continue to form an exclusive support bubble with one other household. You can also meet in a group of two households. Anyone in your support bubble counts as one household in any location, public or private, indoors or outdoors. This does not need to be the same household each time. It remains the case, even inside someone's home, that you should socially distance from anyone not in your household, household or bubble. Those who have been able to perform a, sorry, those who have been able to form a support bubble, which is those in single adult households, can continue to have close contact if they live with other people in their bubble. This should be exclusive and should not change. Moving on now to face coverings and masks. So while the use of face covering is not mandated in the various guidance relevant to the dance sector, it is recommended that you consider using them in indoor public spaces where social distancing isn't possible. Face coverings do not replace social distancing, continue to wash hands regularly and maintain social distancing wherever possible. Face coverings should never be used for children under the age of three. Some exemptions on face coverings might apply to children under 11 or those with a physical or mental illness, impairment or disability that means they cannot put on, wear or remove it. So some further considerations. Employers should support their workers in using face coverings safely if they choose to wear one. This means telling workers to wash your hands thoroughly with soap and water for 20 seconds or use hand sanitizer before putting a face covering on and after removing it. When wearing a face covering, avoid touching your face or face covering as you could contaminate them with germs from your hands. Change your face covering if it becomes damp or if you've touched it and continue to wash your hands regularly. Change and wash your face covering daily. If the material is washable, wash in line with manufacturer's instructions. If it's not washable, dispose of it carefully in your usual waste. And continue to practice social distancing wherever possible. So we'll now hand over to Professor Matthew Wine. Mm -hmm. 
There we go. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Matthew Wyman, I'm an exercise physiologist um, working with dancers. So we're going to have a look at some of the research that has come out um, regarding uh, exercising indoors. And one of the things to um, think about and to um, have a, at the back of your mind as we look at this, this some of this information is that most of this research is on models and um, there's a couple of instances when they've actually gone into a space to carry it out and it's very rarely have they done in spaces where we have um, people actually in them as well and how those people moving in a space could potentially affect some of these models. So there's a few limitations we've got to have a look at. So the uh, World Health Organization has said that um, masks are maybe not recommended for exercise due to breathing difficulties, but um, we've got to look at what we mean by exercise within this. Um, if we're doing um, moderate to high intensity exercise over long periods of time, there's a potential that um, a mask could interfere with your breathing dynamics and um, reduce the amount of or the, the oxygen mix that's coming into, into your lungs just because um, there could be a slight trapping of CO2 in between your mouth and the mask. The biggest, I think, aspect of it is going to be the, around the anxiety of people feeling it when they're first wearing it and having to exercise quite hard. That they're going to feel, oh my god, I'm not getting enough air in. Um, just because they have, um, it's going to be harder to blow the air out through a mask than, and to suck it in. And so they'll feel as though um, they're not getting enough oxygen in. They will be. There's a feeling which they're going to have, they're going to experience. So it might be quite a good idea to start gently and to gradually increase the intensity and dropping back down every time so they get used to the experience rather than um, going straight in and, and everyone panicking and ripping a mask off to feel as they need to get some oxygen. The thing to remember with that class obviously is that because of the technical element of dance class and, and often most rehearsals as well, there is, it's quite low intensity. And so therefore the mask is not going to um, become an Im impediment. It's only when we go a bit later on to higher intensities that, again, we need to maybe have a think about um, how we can adapt the class so that it doesn't become an issue. So it's a mixed, obviously dancers are mixed between aerobic and anaerobic. The, towards the, the beginning bit of class is um, low aerobic demands. Um, and the second, obviously, part of class, when again across centre, is generally more anaerobic in, in, in nature, but or engage the anaerobic system more. So if we have a think of that last part, the first part is something we, we don't really need to wor worry about, as often it's not much more than an um, intensity we see when we go for a brisk walk, and that doesn't, and the mask doesn't have an effect on that. But if we go into the high intensity part, if we think about trying to reduce the amount of dance time in those to around 20 to 30 seconds and so for every second of dance we have um, three or five seconds of rest that allows enough time as well for them to recover fully before they go into the dance into the high intensity bit again and if we don't do any more than 20 to 30 seconds we're not going to put a huge um, anaerobic load on them so that means that when they're in the recovery stage they're not going to be gasping for breath and thinking, oh my God, I can't get enough oxygen through the mask. Um, the biggest thing though, is just, it's, it's often going to be a feel, it's harder than actually a reality that it actually, it actually is. Um, so this means some interesting stuff on droplets and what happens when we exercise. Um, they do go, when, we, when we're exercising hard, they do go further than the two meters because we're breathing hard. If we wear a face mask, we straight away reduce this issue. And so therefore it doesn't have that same effect. So when we're looking at running and cycling, again, these were on models, we're seeing a sort of a five meter effect 
of um, how um, the droplets sort of extending to that sort of area. But within that sort of environment as well, we've got to remember that um, that mask will negate that five meters and bring it back down to um, a normal sort of level. The other interesting thing is obviously most dance classes are quite humid and generally from the research above on the on the running it noted that it took a droplet about five seconds from breath to land on the floor. If I'm in a humid environment which most dances, dance classes are and often they are much higher than the 40 percent it means actually that um, droplets stay in the air for longer. Um, and so that's something else to think of. The other thing to think about is when we add humans to this mix and we've used a description, dancers become egg beaters because all they're doing is wafting around their arms and so they're mixing the air around. And so that droplet, how the droplet falls to the ground is actually going to be affected by everyone's movement and the, and the air sort of dynamics within the room. And so it's a good chance that that's going to increase the time and so therefore droplets are going to be out and about for much longer than that um, half a second to land on the ground. The other interesting thing um, I managed to find from one of those papers just down below is loud speech, i.e. when the teacher's either talking over the music or to the people, um, actually shows that in stagnant air, which the dance class is again, that the droplets stay in the air between 8 to 14 minutes. Um, the difference in time again is the volume and actually air humidity. So I do, if the teacher is not going to be masked, everyone else needs to be. So if the teacher needs to be able to, which it probably is easier not to wear a mask so they can actually uh, speak and be heard, then it's maybe a good idea for others to be masked within this as well. Ventilation. So um we just covered that sort of bit there the whole concept there so yes droplets do get expelled further so we're breathing harder um and uh so wearing a face mask helps reduce this and uh done that one here's some so here's some interesting um research which is something to maybe have a think about Again, remembering that this has not been done with humans in a room. So this was actually done in a, in a space and it was done by a, uh, people at um, UCL and they were looking at indoor heritage environments, i.e. You know, a museum sort of thing. And they noted that their models worked exactly the same as what it actually did in real life. So that's always good to find out. So they found that um, when the, um, increased ventilation increases deposition. So the more windows I have open, actually it causes greater dispersal of any droplets. So it's okay if that ventilation is the outside, but if it's only if you open if your door's open and it's an internal door, all you're doing is actually is chunting more of those droplets out to a space which you're not in control of. So generally, it seems to be a good idea that when people are actually dancing, the internal doors are shut, but the external windows or doors are open. And hopefully that will improve. But then after class, we can actually open that internal door and hopefully that will help um, with the dispersal and, with, and reduction in the concentration. And another interesting thing for that paper was actually realising that where droplets hang out and potential areas that need to be focused on. Interestingly, the wall and the floor cause is friction with the airflow and that causes deep, um, droplet deposition. And so actually you need to focus your cleaning on the walls and edges of the walls near the floors, near the walls. So if you imagine the air bumping, bouncing around, it hits the wall and will drop down. So not only do you have to really think about, okay, I need to, to wash the floor, on the bars, walls, and that section down there along the edges as well as something to really focus on. Thank you very much. So we're now going to move to questions. Uh, 
Okay. So, um, the first one. Uh, the first one is on uh, first aid. So it's a question about first aid uh, needing to be administered. Um, is, it, is it allowed as an exception for social distancing? So um, this is covered in uh, the performing arts guidance. There's a section about accidents and incidents. Um, and I can copy the, the wording in there, um, but uh, basically it's recognized that when there's an accident or or, or, or something similar that um, social distancing does not need to be main maintained, it would be unsafe. Um, but they ask people involved in providing assistance to others that they should pay particular attention <coughs> to sanitation measures uh, immediately afterwards, including washing their hands. So, um, so the answer is no, is no um, but thinking about those things, um, it's, it's fine to um, provide first aid. Um, Next question here, children that do different styles of dance in dance school, how can they manage if they're in a bubble? So um, there's a little bit of confusion about bubbles and fixed teams. So um, what we tried to cover there is that um, the fixed teams uh, is basically a mitigation measure. So um, where social distancing cannot be maintained, um, there are those other mitigation measures that need to be put in place. Um, and one of them is, is fixed teams. So mostly that applies to uh, the working environments, the professional environments. It recognizes that people doing their job in the performing arts are not always uh, necessarily enabled, able to maintain social distance. And in those circumstances, you need to put the other mitigation measures in place. Fixed teams are one of those. Um, this, the label bubbles has come up um, from different places and, it, and it's slightly, confusing I think at times and um, so there's the, the, the social bubble which is extending the household group um, and uh, I think here it's it's being referenced to to schools so um, the reason why uh, children are being put into fixed groups and that's the approach that children back, uh, with children back at school already and will be in September is because it's recognized that young very young children aren't always able to maintain social distance so uh, they, they keep them in a fixed group or a bubble um, in order to have that extra mitigation measure in place. So um, the, the idea of groups of those children being in, in fixed groups appears in various different pieces of guidance. One of them is about out of school settings over the summer holidays. Um, and one of them uh, is elsewhere, depending on the kind of venue that you use to teach young children. But basically, the basic principles um, apply that you need to think about always trying to maintain social distance and thinking about the space that's available and how many people are able to maintain social distance in that space. So the idea is that you, you have enough space for people to maintain a distance uh, whilst recognising that um, some young people may not always be able to do that. And that's where the bubble or the fixed team comes into play because that's the mitigation measure to try and keep it safe. Um, is there anything, uh, Roger, maybe did you want to add something about fixed teams or this idea of bubbles and why that's important? Uh, well, there was quite a few things I was going to add, but you've covered it all. So uh, you've done it. Well done. <laughs> Okay, thanks Roger. So, um, next question then. Uh, so, marking the floor out with two, two meters by two meters per participant, do you need to leave two meters between the boxes? So, not necessarily, but again, the guidance is asking you to look at the space, to think about how many people can maintain social distance in the space, and also to think about how people move around the space and how they get in and out of the space. So, there isn't kind of a hard line on on that, um, but you need to think about um, being able to move in, in and out and around the space. Um, uh, so that that's what you should be thinking about when uh, allowing enough space for people to maintain you know, social distance. Um, first aid answer, first aid question will be answered. Um, yeah, another question about the bubble. So 
15. So that, that number 15 appears in the out of school certificate. So that's for uh, children who are doing after school or, or summer summer group things. That's where the 15 comes in. And that's, again, because of the, the age group and expecting that they may not always be able to maintain social distance. Uh, is, there, is there a maximum number of students per class? Again, that's the same thing. So it depends on the setting. Those out of school settings, there is that specific limit. Um, depending on whether you hire a studio, what kind of space you're using, there may be restrictions on the number of people in the space. Um, but you always need to think about allowing enough space for people to main, maintain social distance where they can and also to have that circulation space and space to move in and out of the studio. Um, I think many of these have kind of been covered. So it's about children under the age of 11. So in, in the way they're treated in schools is that they're, they're perhaps not always going to maintain social distance, which is why they're kept in their cut in the year groups. So again, that's where the fixed, fixed group uh, notion comes in. Uh, does the two household limits apply? So again, it depends on the setting, out of school settings, maximum of 15, um, depending on whether you hire a studio or where it happens, there may be other restrictions. Uh, Matt, maybe this is one for you. So shortening class time, uh, and is there a recommendation uh, for non-professional participants? What's the thinking on that? A human is a human. And so it doesn't really matter if you're a professional, not a human, um, or not a human, a professional, not a not a uh, recreational dancer. Um, I think it's if you, it's just the create. I think it's up to the creativity of the the dance teacher. If you can make a dance class technically hard but physically easier, you're really helping um, the dancers there. So it's not necessary. So you have to have a think of how you want to um, to engage them and to challenge them in their in their learning. Or if you're going to do a, want to a higher intensity class, maybe have a shorter one. So, but I wouldn't ex I wouldn't um, go in straight away. It's what they're used to, um, especially if they're wearing masks, and you want to have a. a a play first to see how it feels for them uh, rather than jumping in and planning something straight from the off. It's something, you know, it's a, it's really at the moment, it's suck it and see rather than having um, actually anything guaranteed this is going to work for them. Thanks, Matt. So to, to add to that, um, a lot of people may have been working um, a lot less, doing a lot less activity um, since lockdown began. And so shortening the class does give an opportunity to get people back in to their activity a bit more gradually. Thanks, Kim, for that too. So Roger, there's one here for you from Dee Lanning, uh, who says, I've been challenged by a member of my dance classes who has said that they have read uh, studies that wearing a mask during exercise is highly dangerous. Can you signpost any studies that show it's safe to wear a mask? Or what's the, what's the science around that? Uh, I don't, I can't quote any, any studies, but uh, the, the general principle, I think, as Matt included in his presentation, uh, you know, wearing a mask is, makes people quite apprehensive to start off with, particularly if you're in the environment or, or doing an activity where you're breathing more rapidly but it's more a, a psycho-emotional impact because you can still get a huge amount of air in. But if it creates anxiety and say, for example, you are an asthmatic, um, that anxiety could potentially then trigger off the asthmatic attack, not the lack of oxygen. So um, as we've already s suggested, you know, that we're, we're asking people to go back into a working environment, which is going to be very different to what they start, what they were doing before lockdown. And it's a matter of getting used to that and therefore shorter classes as Kim was suggesting and Matt was suggesting earlier and the gradual introduction of, of wearing the mask until the person feels progressively more confident with its use is probably going to be fine. Uh, if someone is um, has got uh, 
significant asthma, then that might be an issue and you may want to seek further medical advice about that and any other uh, chronic respiratory illness. Obviously, in the older population, we're talking about chronic obstructive airways disease, but if in the younger population, for children, for example, those with cystic fibrosis or any other chronic lung condition may uh, need further guidance and medical advice on it. But in general, I think uh, it's just a matter of people gradually getting used to wearing the mask. Can I just add, add to that? So if we look at um, oxygen saturation of the blood, so in normal circumstances, we're looking at about you know 99%. I'd always say that the lungs are something which are uh, German engineered. They're so efficient in what they actually achieve. Um, but if we go slightly elsewhere to it and look at the effect of what exercise may up at, up at uh, Mount Everest, we're, we're looking at um, being able to exercise at, um, okay, so it's, it's a very reduced capacity, but you're still able to do it at 60% capacity, uh, um, saturation. So these masks aren't going to cause anything like that. They're going to be, if anything, it's going to, the worst case, maybe a drop down to, 98, 97%, but obviously there's no data on that, but it's not something to worry about. It's about um, oxygen, oxygen saturation at all. The mask will not be interfering with that. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, so there's, there's a question here about uh, corner work or dance phrases that move across the space. Kim, would you like to talk about that? Yes, there's um, just leading on from what Matt was talking about with droplets. Um, wherever possible, um, it's advised to keep social di socially distanced and to keep to the squares if you're using floor markings within a room. Um, but if you would like to introduce travelling and you can do so in a socially distanced way, there is some suggestion that people shouldn't go directly behind the other person when travelling across the room because they'll be entering their slipstream and potentially picking up some of the droplets um, that are left in the air from the person that was traveling um, ahead of them. So you could look at uh, considering having people traveling across the room side by side um, and then potentially people traveling across the room in the other direction to allow some time for those droplets to settle. Um, but do remember the points that Matt was making earlier about the, the more movement there is in the room, the, the more these droplets will be dispersed and won't be able to settle. So um, as long as you provide a, a little bit of time between one person traveling and the next person traveling and maintain social distancing, it should be okay. Also, the droplets are going to hit the clothing more likely if they're even if they're falling behind so it's what you do with your clothing knowing that it's probably going to be contaminated so it's how you clean and wash your your dance your dance kit and then and if you're going to take it on and off obviously to realize that again it's been transferred to your hands and you need to again obviously um, sanitize yourself before you leave in that space and it's that recognition as well Thank you. Um, so there's a question here about uh, seven to 11 year old students wearing masks in dance class. Is that a recommendation as long as they don't have respiratory issues? Um, it, it's not recommended for um, children under the age of 11 or uh, rather children under the age of 11 uh, appear in the, the list of exemptions which was referenced in the presentation. Um, and does anybody from the panel want to say anything about that? From a physiology point of view, I don't think it, it, it'll impair what they do, um, as long as the class is easy. Um, yeah, I think that's just it. So it's, it's what they're used to. It's going to increase their anxiety, potentially. Um, it's not physiologically going to have a bad influence on them. Thanks, Matt. Um, so can, I, can I just come in uh, again? I'm just thinking about the points that we've been raising about this droplet transmission. And I, it, it's important in this whole area to understand there's, there's so many unknowns and we can only really talk in terms of concepts uh, until we've got clear research to 
guide us. Um, and therefore I want to introduce yet another concept, um, but a, a concept which I think is important for people to recognize. And that is, you know, the occasional droplet, which may be carrying small amounts of the virus is not necessarily that dangerous. What is known to be dangerous is what a concept called viral load. So the higher the concentration of the virus in an environment, the greater the risk, and not only the greater risk of getting the disease, but the higher viral load someone inhales, the more likely they are to get a more severe form of the disease. So this is a, an important concept because if you can keep a room very well ventilated and there's maybe one person who's got low viral load and, and is breathing that out, but the, the air is constantly flowing through, the risks to the other people, even though there may be a potential carrier in there, is, um, is small. And this goes to the other concept that people may have read in the literature about what are called super spreaders. And these are people who've got very, very high viral load who are usually asymptomatic and they're breathing and coughing and so on and so forth. And each time they exhale, a large amount of virus comes out from them and is transmitted around. And there's no way of predicting those patients until they start becoming symptomatic. So it's those that are, are the risk. But if it's just the occasional droplet you know the risks to other people are still relatively low and providing the ventilation in the room is good then that the most of the the virus will be moved on so uh, just another concept to think about risk mitigation sorry to introduce that but it is an important concept thanks roger um so there's a question from lees about professional performers uh, or tech crew working in a fixed team at work and living at home during the creation and rehearsal period of production. Um, what implications does their living with other people, for their family and housemates, uh, who may be working in other fixed teams outside of the home have? And do uh, other members of the home household need to be considered in a risk assessment? Uh, and what, what uh, mitigations would you put in place? Um, so Roger, can you have your thoughts first on that? Yeah, so that's um, a very good question, quite a complicated question to answer because there's lots of different things to take into consideration. Uh, you know, are the other members of that household uh, carrying any comorbidities which may put them at risk of having a severe COVID illness if they were to catch it? So we're talking about people with obesity, uh, type 2 diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, the elderly, all those sort of things. And therefore, if you, you come from a household where there's those sort of people around and some of those may be uh, what's called shielding, i.e. in isolation adv as advised by their, uh, their medical professionals, then you need to think very clearly about someone who's going in and out of work day in, day out and exposed to uh, lots of different people. So that, that's one issue and that's a really, really key issue. And it should be relatively easy to identify if there are high risk members in your household. And then clearly, uh, you know, we can't completely remove risk. All we can do is mitigate risk. And, uh, you know, the ideal situation would be the bubble that you work in should be the bubble that you live with as well. And if you look at what, you know, the England uh, or the West Indian cricket team are doing, and supposedly the England cricket team should have been doing, apart from one member in the last uh, few days, they're living in isolation. So they're not uh, putting the risk of cross-contamination in there. But that's not practical for everyone in this world. And so, so this is always going to be a problem. And, and all one can say is one should reduce the number of uh, the range of people someone is exposed to. So if you're going between home and uh, uh, a dance uh, uh, studio, uh, trying to avoid public transport, if at all possible, would be beneficial. Trying to walk, go by cycle uh, would be better. If you are living in a household, then a, ha a relatively small household would be better. And uh, trying to avoid households where there's multiple occupants all going to different places of work. So some of these things may not be practical, but it's just things to think about and all these by controlling all of these things you mitigate risk but there's no such thing as no risk we can just work towards trying to reduce risk and particularly reduce risk to vulnerable people thank you roger um, so there's a question about uh, designation of partners in respect uh, to groups 
mean that contact work is possible. So um, the performing arts guidance for um, professionals working um, recognises that sometimes people have to partner each other or work closely together and that's when uh, the fixed group uh, mitigation measure comes into play. So uh, the, the companies, the big uh, dance companies, um, are, will be managing that risk by uh, keeping dancers in fixed groups. Um, and perhaps Kim might have something useful to say about that as well, in terms of um, how schools could go to us. Yes, we uh, initially won't be um, encouraging partner work within the schools because it's something initially that we will be able to avoid. However, I am aware of a, um, a production um, being undertaken by the place where there are people that will be working in partners and because that's a professional environment, um, one of the mitigation factors that they are implementing is testing before those uh, partners work together. Um, so within our dance school, we won't be partnering uh, while social distancing measures are in place, if at all possible. Thanks, Kim. Um, so there are a couple of kind of practical questions. Um, one is about uh, outdoor shoes. Um, is it important to leave outdoor shoes uh, outside? Should they go in a box? Um, uh, does the next person use the same box? Um, any thoughts from the panel, Matt, perhaps? Again, it's just about mitigating risk. So um, the more you can, if you come in, take your shoes off, put them in a bag, rather, and then put them in the cubby hole or whatever it is. It's just looking at how you can help um, reduce cross-contamination in, from environments you don't know where the potential risk is. Um, and a, a kind of follow-up, which is directed. Can I? So uh, someone asked the same question uh, at our last webinar, um, and uh, I mentioned that there was a study some some weeks ago showing that the virus can be carried on shoes, and uh, and therefore ex I can completely concur with what Matt said that you, you know, taking the shoes off, uh, putting them in a bag, keeping them separated then washing the hands etc etc is so important um, and that is going to help to mitigate risk. Thanks Roger and yeah we have, um, I was on a different uh, Q&A session last week and we heard from some teachers uh, in Greece and Italy and that is something that they are doing there so when um, students come into class as they step into the building and they step onto a disinfectant mat then they take the shoes off and put them in a plastic bag and they're stored until they, they leave again. So this is definitely something worth thinking about. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of follow-up question directed specifically at Matt. Does the temperature of the room make any difference? If we have windows and doors open, um, we might need our heating on higher. No. So the, the, the same study that looked at humidity looked at temperature and they saw no difference when it came to temperature it was just a humidity thing so obviously humidity is related to the amount of water in the air and so increased humidity means those droplets are hanging around longer temperature was not an issue uh, they looked at up to the top of my head up um, 20 30 and 40 degrees I think so if any dance um, class is up to 40 degrees you're sweating like a mad anyway and it's going to be unbelievably hot in there uh, thanks. And there's a question about wooden floors in rented studios, which is quite common. How can I clean them without uh, then risking them not being dry in time? So what the guidance says is that um, cleaning of uh, high contact areas is, is particularly important between the use of different groups. So if you do have different groups, different classes using the same space, um, then you will need to think about cleaning the space thoroughly. Um, before the next group comes in. Uh, ah, yes, and there's a question that came up the other day as well, and I, I don't know the answer. Are fogger machines recommended for effectively cleaning dance studios? Do we all know on the panel what fogger machines are? So they're good for trains. So I see them using them on, on the trains. Um, 
but I think it depends what you put in your fogger machine um, to do. And uh, I think Milton kills absolutely everything known to to man. So if you, it's, so it doesn't matter. You know, a fogger machine is a fogger machine. It's what you fog is the thing that's important, and to make sure that what you are you've got in there is the thing that can actually have an effect, rather than just um, adding to the humidity of the environment. Thanks, Matt. Um, so there's a question about whether for a teacher uh, it might be better to wear a visor or a face mask or both. Do we think there's a difference in, in the two um, uh, that would help or hinder? Roger, do you have a view on that? So um, again, it's all about, you know, as we go back to this concept of mitigating risk, it depends where the teacher is standing, how close the teacher needs to get to the pupils. You know, if clearly if they're keeping a persistently keeping more than two meter distance, then the need for uh, the mask and the visor um, is less important. But as that, those distances come down and having the freedom to move around more, more then uh, wearing both would probably be preferable uh, to wear the, wearing none. And uh, if it's a, a mask or a visor, which one would I go for? I think uh, there's probably is some research out there. I'm not familiar with it. Uh, as a gut feeling, I would have thought that the visor is the better option, but uh, I've, I'm not saying that on any sort of scientific knowledge. Has anyone else got a view on that? I don't have a view on the scientific knowledge, but we have had conversations amongst our team about whether we would prefer masks or visors and um, I think there was a general consensus that visors would be preferable for teachers purely so that students could see their mouth uh, their mouth moving while they were speaking um, just because it, it just feels a little bit more personable than not being able to see the mouth. And there is a bit of research not much um, the, the issue the issue in a, um, a, the shield comes comes um, into play is how close you get to the person so because it's, it's guiding airflow so when you breathe out it's pushing it down onto the side so if you are a, like a, a consultant uh, no you're a clin clinician you're going to potentially without not wearing a mask you're just going to be breathing down the person below you so if you're in a dance class standing up it's not an issue and yeah it, it provides a bit of protection um, against uh, but everyone, everyone will be able to see your face but then following that on, on from that, Matt, then I suppose if you're a teacher teaching young children, then the visor wouldn't be a good idea. Well, it depends on how close you're getting to them. If, it's, it's, if you think it's the, if they're right underneath you, mm. then it is, but if, as long as they're sort of, sort of a metre away or so, then I think that should be okay. There was, mm. there was arguments, I can remember us having a chat to some guys in the States about this, um, even for dancers dancing in it. And he was, he tried both out. He's a, um, a doctor over there, and he got a and about benefits. And again, it's it's up for grabs at the moment. Um, there's two sort of courts. One believes in the mask. One believes in um, both visor and mask. That's the, probably the best. Obviously, visor mask is the best. But if you can't see the mouth, and then and also I suppose um, it's brought up as well with. Um, deaf communities and not being able to see the mouth and be able to lip read, etc. And actually that's where maybe the shield is, is, is optimal. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, so there's a question from James, which I think is about a uh, professional dance company context. He's asking, does the guidance on no more than six people from two households meeting apply when bringing dancers back to the studio? Um, Recognise the name and just the, the way it's expressed. I think he's talking about um, uh, professional dancers. So you remember at the top of the presentation, um, we, but the guidance makes that distinction between professional and non-professional activity. So um, if it's dancers who are employed uh, to work as professional dancers, um, then the, the, that uh, household limit that is, is referenced doesn't apply in that context, it's a professional context. Um, but you still need to think about space and maintaining social distance and uh, how many people you can fit in the space maintaining social distance um, and putting those extra 
mitigation measures in place um, when it's not possible to maintain social distance. Uh, and uh, so the non-professional, so groups that include non-professionals or mixture, um, at the moment have to refer to that meeting people from outside of your household guidance, which is the six people um, or two households. I think um, we've kind of run out of time. So Erin, do you want to, to wrap up? Absolutely. So um, just to wrap up very briefly here, um, thank you to everyone again for attending this webinar. Um, we certainly understand that there are still lots and lots of questions. So we have um, uh, at least two more sessions uh, planned um, that we've already announced. So on Wednesday, the 22nd of July, we'll be speaking specifically about considerations for vulnerable groups, including BM BAME and disabled people. Um, so definitely tune in there if you work with anyone who might be considered vulnerable. Um, I saw lots of questions in the Q&A box today about uh, vulnerable groups, especially older people um, in the question today. And then next Friday, the 24th of July, we'll be tackling social distancing in dance part two, um, specific activities and risk, class structure, floor work, and contact. Um, we've talked a little bit about that today, but it uh, sounds like there's probably more to discuss as well. We're also gonna be planning future webinars which will directly address children and young people, freelancers, alternatives to face-to-face, -to -face, transport, touring and travel, and physical and mental preparation for returning to dance. So we really hope that you'll all be able to enjoy those. Uh, we really hope you'll all be able to join us for those sessions and we appreciate you attending the webinar. This webinar will be available for you to uh, watch uh, via our website. Um, just search One Dance UK Return to Dance. So thank you everyone and we will look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.